All righty. G'day. My name's Clint Patterson, and uh, I have a uh, very unusual story to share with you today about how I overcame a terrible crippling disease called rheumatoid arthritis and how my journey and my discoveries may provide some hope for other people with this terrible disease. So it started for me um, seven years ago, back uh, when I was 31. And I woke up in the morning and I had sore feet. And I didn't know why I had sore feet. I thought maybe I'd left my feet out of the covers during the night time, because I'm six foot two. That happens from time to time. Um, but after this persisted for a week or two, and I started to get uh, swelling in my fingers, I thought maybe something's wrong. And so I went to the GP, and the GP ran some blood tests, and he called me back in and he said, you've got something called rheumatoid arthritis. And I said, rheuma what? You know, I'd never heard of this disease. And he said, it's actually an autoimmune disease where your body attacks itself. And he said, think of multiple sclerosis. What happens there is it's a crippling, debilitating disease where the body attacks the lining outside the nerve endings. But with rheumatoid arthritis, it attacks the lining around your joints, so it destroys your joints. He said, in fact, there's no cure. And he said, of all the diseases that he would not want to get, that would be at the top of his list. All right? And I said, thanks, doctor. I should have come to you with all my problems. Right? And he sent me off with a referral to a rheumatologist. And a rheumatologist is a specialist doctor who specializes in inflammatory arthritis. Now, he gets me in after a uh, long wait, and uh, he gets me in, and he tells me that the standard approach for this drug, sorry, for this disease, is to take drugs for the rest of your life. Also, you are expected to go on to drugs immediately. Um, and in addition, the first drug on offer was a drug that's previously a cancer drug called methotrexate that 90% of people with rheumatoid arthritis go on at some point in their, in their journey. And uh, he said, so when do you want to get started? I said, well, as attractive as that sounds, um, I might think about it for a while. So what I did is I went away to think about it. I thought, no one in my family has ever had rheumatoid arthritis. As I said, I'd never heard of it. All right? And I was sports captain at school. I was sports captain in my college at university. I was cross-country champion, and I ran the Sydney City to Surf in 69 minutes without training. So I was a fit guy. And I thought, you know, I should be able to beat this thing on my own. I had a lot of time on my hands. Um, I have been working stand-up comedy professionally for a very long time, and I thought, I only have to work a couple of nights a week, and I can just work this out in all my spare time. And so what I did is I went to see every naturopath, every homeopath, every Chinese herbalist, every acupuncturist, every massage therapist, and took every supplement under the sun. I took about 50 different supplements, not all at the same time. Um, I took at any one time probably 10 different supplements. And all your classics for arthritis, like fish oils, krill oils, calcium, glycosamine, sulfate, all your standard stuff. And every morning I woke up and I was certain upon that first little eyes pop open that I will have gotten rid of this disease. I've always been a positive person and I knew that I could do it. After 18 months, quite the opposite. I was an absolute disaster. I couldn't even bend my left elbow. It was so swollen, it was locked up like this. They had to do a synovectomy uh, surgery, which is overnight in the hospital, and cut away all my soft tissue in my left elbow so that it could start to move. I had to get on a rehabilitation machine for six weeks, and on this machine, I had to be on that for 10 hours a day, every single day. My fingers were so swollen that I couldn't actually close and create a fist. As a result, every single night, I had to grab the Moduna with my teeth and pull it over me like that. But the worst was that I had pain in my chest, so with every breath I would have pain. I had pain in my jaw, every bite of food I had pain, and it was in 80% of my body. And the worst of all was my knee. Oh my God, that's hurting. All right. So, oh, got my knee out like this. And just try and stand up. And... Maybe make my way over. This is how I'm walking, which is not really much of a walk. And uh, here we are in the. Let's have a look here. Oh, look at that. Big squall and boy there on the left hand side. 
Okay, so rheumatoid arthritis feels like glass, like shards of glass in your joints. So this was absolutely excruciating. And so I had to go back to my doctor and say, hey, are you still selling that methotrexate? <laughs> he put me on 10 milligrams a week of methotrexate, which is a low dose considering where I was. He started me off on that. But methotrexate slowly wears off with time, and I did 12 months on methotrexate. Now, it reduced about 50% of the pain at first, but as I said, it wears off. And so by 12 months' time, um, I was suffering so much fatigue from the drug, which is a massive side effect, as well as the fatigue from rheumatoid, as well as um, uh, I was still not getting better, right? I was still deteriorating. And one of the biggest problems besides the fatigue with methotrexate um, is that you cannot have kids on methotrexate, right? It's a drug where you require six months of, of uh, neutral time after taking it before you can try and conceive because it's so toxic for your inner fluids. And so I remember sitting there in the rheumatologist's office. My wife used to come with me to every single visit. She was sitting next to me and the doctor put me on 25 milligram, which is the maximum dose. And uh, I had no real other option. And she's looking at me and I thought, I've let my wife down. She's expecting so much out of me, and I'm crippled. I'm doing three hours of hot yoga every single day just to walk, and I am just basically letting us down, and we can never have kids. And so in that moment, I decided I would do anything in the world to work out how to end this living nightmare. So what it is, I went home, and that day, I scribbled on a bit of paper, and it said, pain-free, drug-free, and back to maximum energy. And I whacked it on the fridge, and that became my goal and my mantra. Until that point, I believed that everyone else was going to solve my problem. I was outsourcing it to naturopaths and all of the other specialists, which did as best as they could. But I realized if I'm going to solve this, I have to look deep inside and work out what I can do to fix this disease myself. Now, fortunately, I have a lot of skills. Um, I went to Macquarie University, which is almost as good as Bond, um, <laughs> and uh, I got first class honours in laser physics, optoelectronics. I got straight A's in my honours year. I was a semi-finalist in the science category for Young Australian of the Year. In, uh, at 23, I published a scientific journal paper in an international journal called The Fabrication of Multiple Fibre Optical Bragg Gratings Using Frequency Doubled Copper Vapor Lasers. And I thought, <laughs> If I can do that, I should be able to kick some rheumatoid butt, right? So that's what I decided. Now, I, just, I began to study rheumatoid arthritis and its underlying cause like it was a second university degree. I've since calculated I've spent more time on that than what I have actually on my original degree. Um, and I studied the digestive system and it's linked to rheumatoid arthritis because I'd bought two books, the only two books in the world written by people who had recovered from this disease and they'd both done it through diet. And although all the medical, medical community said diet has nothing to do with arthritis, I thought it's worth a shot. So I started studying, but one of the things that gave me the greatest insight was what I call the cherry incident now. I ate a bunch of cherries and what happened is they were unwashed and I got violently sick and vomited and diarrheaed for 24 hours. But at the end of that, miraculously, I felt amazing. No pain, <laughs> right? And I'm like, what's going on here? Clearly there was a relationship between the digestive process and the disease, because when I'm empty, I feel amazing. All I needed to do was work out how to feel like that without having to vomit and diarrhea for the rest of my life. <laughs> okay. And so I went on an enormous health kick like you have never seen in your life. I started doing green juicing. I was doing wheatgrass shots like five a day. And I found that every time I stopped eating, I felt better, but I eat again and I felt pain. And so I thought, okay, I need to find a way of eating so I get enough calories to live, but, and I have my pain at absolute minimum. And for me, that was a raw food diet which was my entire calories were coming from soaked almonds, soaked macadamia nuts, and soaked pumpkin seeds. And I ate salads like <laughs> that sort of stuff, a little bit of fruit. And I lived off that diet for eight months. Okay? Now, not because I wanted to find out what it's like to live like a chimpanzee, <laughs> but because I was getting pain relief. And by the end of that eight months, I'd got rid of the pain in my chest, the pain in my jaw, the pain in my ankles, and I knew that I was on the right track. And then I started to introduce some cooked foods which previously I couldn't eat, like buckwheat and quinoa and brown rice and pumpkin, very alkalizing, easy to digest, predominantly carbohydrate foods. And then after 24 months of nonstop dietary craziness where I only ate these sorts of foods, I was finally able to get off 
the methotrexate. So it says on my blood test now, if I ever go for a blood test again previously on methotrexate, I was able to have my fingers return to normal. As you can see, there's nothing wrong with my fingers anymore. And my wife and I went out to the Blue Mountains where I had proposed to her years before on an agonizingly get down on one knee and she was able to film me running for the first time in half a decade. Yep. Filming video? Yep. <laughs> Go, honey! Yeah! <laughs> right. That's obviously my wife. She's got the American accent, right? Um, and so we were so happy, right? But to get to that point was astronomically hard, right? I'm so, I don't know how hard it was to climb Mount Everest, right? But I would have swapped. It's that difficult, okay? It's that difficult. However, it was totally worth it. My blood test results now, um, my C-reactive protein, which used to be 50 milligrams per litre when I was first diagnosed, you're meant to be below 5. I got it below five and now it sits below one, which is actually lower than the average person on the street who has no diseases at all. Okay, so that's where I'm at at the moment. I eat a low-fat, plant-based diet and it's both diverse and delicious and I have no fear of this disease absolutely ever again. Now, I believe we can summarize what's going on here through the scientific literature, which I studied, as I said, for many years. What I believe we can do is to bring this right down to the acronym that I created called BLAME, which stands for bacterial overgrowth, leaky gut, acid levels in the stomach, mucosal lining, and enzymes. Now, studies have shown this about rheumatoid arthritis sufferers, is that they, um, instead of having two kilograms of healthy bacteria like the rest of us, people with RA have an overgrowth of bad bacteria. Not only that, the more bad bacteria, the worse their inflammation in their joints. They have a concept called leaky gut. What's happening is that little holes form in the 22 feet of intestines that you have for your food to go through, just like water leaking out of a hose. Those food particles, undigested, get into the bloodstream. Your body's immune system says antigen, throws in an antibody, combines them together to create a circulating immune complex. These are normally eliminated, but in some cases they can lodge in the small capillaries of the joints and trigger inflammation. The acid levels in the stomach, which we all need to break down particularly proteins in people with rheumatoid arthritis, is too low and in many cases non-existent, which is way more common than you'd think, particularly in old people, even without rheumatoid. Without the ability to break down the proteins, what happens is that proteins then go through undigested, so they're not broken down into amino acids, they stay as a protein into the bloodstream, which is very bad news, they shouldn't be there then the body sees them as an antigen. When the body creates an, anti, uh, an antibody against a protein, you're in dangerous territory because then the body eventually can make an incredibly horrible error and start to see proteins as an enemy. And when that occurs, you've got molecular mimicry. The body is starting to see proteins and in the case of RA, it sees the lining of your joints as enemies and starts to destroy it. And that molecular mimicry is the mechanism behind rheumatoid arthritis that's best used and has been the best model in the last 20 years for this disease. A lot of people with rheumatoid arthritis have lost their mucosal protective lining, which is also used to absorb nutrients. And so without this mucosal lining, you're not absorbing your nutrients. You're not protecting that single cellular layer of your intestinal wall from these undigested particles. And as a result, they've done biopsies of people's intestines with RA and found that in some cases they don't even have an epithelium. Okay, so all sorts of stuff's going into that blood. And finally, you need enzymes, which are little scissors that break down your food particles, carbohydrates into simple sugars, and you've got proteins into amino acids, and fats just break down into fatty acids. But without enzymes, which are like little scissors to cut these particles and break them into smaller components, these large components are getting through the blood and getting into the blood and causing major problems with the immune system. Now, if it got that bad, how does it get like this? How do people end up with stomachs like this? Well, there's several ways that this occurs. One way is by taking non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for a long time, and we know them as Panadol, Advil, Voltaren. If you buy them over the counter and you start munching on them in big quantities, you're gonna destroy your gut and create leaky gut, and this is not a good idea taking antibiotics for a long period of time. And this was a big aha for me, is that I took antibiotics for acne 
for nearly five years when I was a teenager. And I believe that went a long way to totally ruining my healthy flora in my gut and setting myself up for later in life rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, what else is going wrong? Also in here, we heard earlier from another speaker about the concept of stress. They've done studies and they've shown that students, when they're about to sit exams, the number of bacteria, healthy bacteria in their stool drops by 50% on stressful days. If you keep that up over a long time, think about how you're losing your healthy bacteria, which is important for so many things in the body. And so in addition to that, we also have to consider what we're putting in. What we're eating makes such an enormous difference. I had a reasonable diet. But if you're doing some of these things on a consistent basis and you're also consuming processed foods, fast foods, and even though a lot of people don't like this, the truth is if you're eating lots of meat and lots of dairy products, you are not setting yourself up for an environment to have uh, healthy bacteria thrive. It just doesn't work that way. In fact, Hiromi Shinya, who is one of the most famous gastroenterologists in the world, based in the Einstein Clinic in New York in his 70s, never missed a day of work for health in his life, says he's never seen in the 350,000 patients that he has seen in his life a healthy intestine for someone who consumes dairy products on a regular basis. All right, so if we know all this, then what if we reversed it? What if we addressed all this? And that's exactly what I've been doing with people over the last few years. So since recovering, I've now gone out and, and helped people with rheumatoid arthritis. And in doing so, I've been able to see some tremendous recoveries. And in all cases, people improve a little bit. And in some cases, some incredible recoveries and life-changing uh, situations for some people. So I've also gone out and uh, become an ambassador for Arthritis New South Wales. They invited me to become an ambassador and here I am hosting an event on Bondi Beach in Sydney and also contribute to their magazines with, uh, with health columns. And so I believe there is hope. I believe there is so much hope with rheumatoid arthritis for other people who can think about ways of working with this disease other than just being a patient of rheumatoid arthritis. And of course, there's so much hope now restored for my wife and I in our family because one of the huge motivators for us was being able to have children. And we're so delighted to say that on the 5th of April, which is only six weeks ago, we had our first little girl and that's, <laughs> that's her there with my beautiful wife. Um, thank you. And she's going to be the most cherished and loved and adored little girl in the world, but she won't be getting ice cream. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>